Okay, everyone. So we're now going to move on to one of the highlights of the day, our special guest speaker. And it's Dr. Yanina Ramirez. And she's going to be talking about her upcoming book, Femina, A New History of the Middle Ages, through uh, the women written out of it. And I understand a first draft has just been delivered, which is excellent. So this groundbreaking reappraisal of medieval history reveals why women were struck, were struck, sorry, from our historical narrative. Not stuck, struck, <laughs> sorry. They might have been stuck as well. Um, <laughs> restoring them to their rightful uh, positions as the power players who shape the world we live in today. Now, Dr. Ramirez is an Oxford lecturer, BBC broadcaster, as many of you will know, researcher and author. She's also, I guess, one of Britain's most recognisable historians. Uh, she's written and presented over 30 hours of BBC history documentaries and series on TV and radio, and written five books for children and authors. And without further ado, I am now going to hand over to Yanine. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. That was really kind. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Now, I think you all knew I was coming because I said uh, there is no way I'll be able to stand behind the lectern and talk because I, I do a lot of this when I talk. So I have a head mic. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent, excellent. I want to pass on my congratulations to Jill. She was clearly very important to you all and, and good luck on, on her retirement. Um, I feel like I'm among friends when I come to speak to a group like you. Local historians, you have been doing what the whole discipline of history should have been doing all along. <laughs> but you have, you, have, you have been looking for those people who've been ignored from the past. You have been really going through archives. You have been looking at storytelling, putting people back into the places they lived in, the streets they walked on, the landscapes that surrounded them. So I salute every one of you here and online. Well done, local historians. You are the core of history as a discipline. <laughs> I also have a little bit of a treat. Um, this book is not out until the 21st of July, um, but I have a proof copy. And I checked with my publishers if it's okay to do with this, and she says it is. So I would like to give this book to someone here today. Um, it's signed. I'm going to do it as a quiz, though. <laughs> first person with their hand in the air gets to answer first. So my question is, what kingdom was Athelflaed the lady of? Oh, yes! Yes! <laughs> well deserved. Well deserved. <laughs> Excellently done. Brilliant. So uh, my baby book is out in the world. It is growing wings. Um, as Paul said there, you know, it is now in print, and I think that the actual physical copy is turned up at my publishers today. So it will start coming out to bookshops, but it's not released till the 21st of July. That doesn't mean you can't pre-order. Please pre-order, because it helps. Um, and I've come to talk to you today because I've been a busy bee during lockdown. I wrote Femina, and I also wrote this beautiful book, Goddess, which, um, which is is available to buy in all good bookshops. And um, if, so when I, what I want to do is start off by telling you the thought processes I've been going through for the last few years in my research and you know, why I'm so delighted to be speaking to you today, why I'm trying to do something different with Femina that I don't think has been done properly really um, before. So I'm proud of it, but I'm also excited and nervous, of course, of doing this. But I want to start with a quote from... Hildegard of Bingham. She comes right at the centre point of the book. She's like the central chapter. And, and she's just this absolutely awe-inspiring individual. Has anyone heard of her, Hildegard of Bingham? Yeah, good few hands going up. She was, uh, she, she was born in 1098, and she grew up in and around um, the Rhineland. Uh, she was in a monastery in Dissi-Bodenberg, which I had the immense pleasure of being all alone in on a stormy day at the top of a hill for an entire day, pouring over the ruins and feeling my way into her space. She died at the age of 81, which I think makes a difference because she managed to cram in the equivalent of four lifetimes into what she achieved. She wrote the, the most enormous amounts of books, philosophical, theological, but also medical, scientific. She's the founder of natural sciences in Germany. She was a musician. Her music to this day 
It's unlike anything else that was written during that period. It's so beautiful, it's so distinctive, so different. She was an artist, she did these illustrations. She was just the most extraordinary polymath, and yet she's so little known about. I like to say she's Leonardo da Vinci, hundreds of years before Leonardo da Vinci, and better than Leonardo da Vinci. And yet, her story gets told very rarely. But I wanted to start with this quote, because for me, it comes right at the top of Feminar, and it sums up how I feel about writing this book. I am the fiery life of divine substance. I blaze above the beauty of the fields. I shine in the water. I burn in sun, moon, and stars. And this is um, an illustration from one of her works, Scivias. And as I say, she, she was, had a hand in these illustrations. And look at that. It is so unlike anything else, I think, that's, that's around from medieval manuscripts. It's, she's trying to capture in words, in sound, in art, what her visions looked like. And what we now think was that Hildegard was a migraine sufferer from a very young age. The things she describes, the scotoma, the, the light and dark, the jagged edges that she sees around things, they all ring true with sufferers of migraines. Um, and yet, she undergoes a bit of a change as she goes into, I think, the menopause. And her visions start to take on an even more intense nature. And that's when she starts to write. And she goes out in the world. She becomes a best-selling author. She goes on book tours. And this is a woman living a nearly a 1,000 years ago. Now, I like to think, to anybody who opens up that book, you will have preconceived ideas about the role of women in the past. I certainly did, which is why I wrote the book. And what I discovered quite quickly was a lot, of our mo a lot of our assumptions today about women being the second sex, the real tireless work that men and women have been doing more, for more than 100 years to bring about votes for women, to bring about e some sense of equality in the workplace. These things seem like they're an entirely modern phenomenon, that, that it's just the work of the last 100 years or so that has made this happen. But what I realized in this book is it was a, an invented distinction that came about and was quite contrived from the Reformation onwards. The deliberate suppression of female rights took place over a, a number of centuries. It was accelerated during the 18th century and the age of colonialism, but it was part of um, a deliberate attempt to put women in, women in the place of the second sex. In the time of Hildegard, there is still gender discrimination. But she is surrounded by a cast of men and women who are changing the landscape. They're involved in politics. Hildegard was known as the Sybil of the Rhine because she had the ear of the emperor, the pope, and the major kings and queens of Europe. So this sort of gives us a slightly different view of the past. And this is a view that I'm encountering again and again in my research. Now that I'm looking for them, Surprise, surprise, I'm finding these women. There was a best-selling um, book that came out last year about um, the period I study, the early medieval period. And in that, there's an apology near the beginning which says, I'm really sorry, I haven't put in any women from the early medieval period because they are simply unrecoverable. Well, 600 pages of feminine, I will tell you that's not the case. They are not unrecoverable. They're just harder to look for, and you need different skills, and you need the skills that you local historians use to find them, but they are there. Um, and it's the same, in a way, with goddesses. I started off with lots of preconceptions when I began writing that book. I believed that... You know, I was going to write 50 accounts of fertility deities, of, of sort of the idea of women as birthers, women as mothers, women as nurturers. And I was thinking about some of these beautiful ancient sculptures, um, uh, Villandoff and, and Holofels. Um, and of course, you know, I, I started to look backwards in order to look forward. So I went way back. I went back to um, those pieces, which are over 10,000 years old, then to Chatelhuyak, which is about 6,000 years ago. This is probably the world's oldest city. And it is an astonishing place, Chattel um, it, There are people living in city dwellings, right on top of each other, like we do today. Their houses were right up next to each other. And the way that people got around the city wasn't through a sequence of streets and doors. They went over the rooftops and dropped down into their houses via ladders. But that's how cheek by jowl people were living all this time ago. And what's been incredible, finds like this came up originally when the, the day began. And she is beautiful. She is this sort of 
uh, Jimmy Mallard, who discovered Chattel Hoyat, describes her as this divine goddess, this, this powerful woman. Um, she's got her arms subduing two panthers because she's got this sort of power over nature. So he proposed that there was probably some sort of worship of a goddess deity at Chattel Hoyak. But what was so extraordinary about this place, which is thousands and thousands of years old, is there was no centralised point of power in the city that we've discovered. No church, no palace, no administrative buildings. People were all living quite a, in a, quite an egalitarian way. And that certainly seems to be the case between the sexes too. When archaeological excavation, um, where osteo and DNA analysis was done on the bones, they discovered male and female bones, many, many hundreds of them. And they looked at the wear and tear, things like repeated action. So many of you will know this, but if you do a repeated action over and over, it leaves an imprint on the skeleton. So long bowmen, for example, uh, during the Hundred Years' War, get these very overdeveloped scapula. Um, they looked at the works that these bodies were doing. They looked at their diets. They looked to see if there was any differentiation. If you look in a graveyard even today, and you find a, a male set of male bones and you find a set of female bones, you will see from looking across a broad amount differences between what each of them eat, what sort of um, activities each of them are doing, and this leaves an imprint on the skeleton. Remarkably, at Chattel Hoyak, there was no difference. The men and the women were living alongside each other, doing exactly the same jobs, eating exactly the same things, with no differentiation. Now, I can't help think <laughs> that in 6,000 years, we've sort of gone backwards <laughs> rather than forwards. Um, and it is wonderful to look further back in the past to find these sorts of, of sources of inspiration. And that was certainly the, the case when I went to Knossos as well in Crete, a, uh, the Minoan civilization where actually the pendulum had swung the other way. It's the men who were the athletes, the entertainers, Painters, the ones that are doing the hard work, the decision makers, all the leaders of the religion, the leaders of the um, politics, the decision makers are women. So there's this variety that we see across time and across space. So I thought I want to apply that to the period I love, the medieval period. And that's what really was the spark. All this curiosity. I, I am a child at heart, I think. I love a detective story. I love fascinating stories from the past, and I love looking for new ways of digging up evidence, finding evidence, which is why I wrote this book. It moves across a number of centuries. We start in the 7th century, and we go right through to the 14th century. So that is a big time period. It also moves across space. I didn't want it just to be about the British Isles. I wanted to show that, you know, we had this concept, and you'll all know this, but we have a very clear idea that individuals, particularly in the medieval period, lived and died, were married, you know, had all their major events within sight of their local parish church, and basically they didn't really go anywhere. That's not the case. This was a cosmopolitan, engaged, interconnected world where trade is taking place along the Silk Road. You know, you've got Buddhas made of jade turning up in Sweden. You know, this is not a world that's tiny and closed. It is interconnected. And at the very end, I'm going to talk to you about the wonderful Marjorie Kemp. Does that name ring any bells to anyone in here? Does anyone know who Marjorie Kemp is? Some nice nods going. Good. So she's our end point, if you like. Um, Marjorie herself, in the 14th century, travelled to all the locations I have chosen in this book. So we start off in the north of England, we move down into the south of England, then we go over to Sweden, then we go down to northern France, to Normandy, then we go across Poland and into we go across um, Europe and into Germany, then we go down to the south of France with the Cathars, over to Poland um, to look at Jadwiga, and then we end up back in, um, in East Anglia, and finally in London, this beating metropolis in the 14th century. So I deliberately wanted to take you on a journey through time and place. <laughs> but it's, um, it was, as a result, a very hard book to research. And you'll know the, the intricacies of researching, particularly if you're working with archives that are in different languages. So I have used a lot of different languages in, in my research here, but also called on the help of others in my research. So, let's move to our first person that I want to talk to you about from the book. And she is chapter number one, and she is called the Loftus Princess. Now, I don't know if anyone knows anything about her. She 
I didn't know anything about her when I started this book. I'll tell you why. I, um, I, I'd written a previous book about the lives of saints from the medieval period. And in that, I'd done a lot on Hilda of Whitby, who I think is amazing. And I go to Whitby quite a lot. It's nothing to do with being a goth. I just like Whitby. Um, uh, <laughs> but I went up on this one occasion with my kids. And where my friend's house is, we have to go through the abbey ruins to get down the, the, the steps to her house. So we're passing through, and as we're coming back, the children are tired, we've had a long weekend, they're windswept, they're exhausted, they're trying to get back to the car. And one of the guides appears on the site as we're leaving the, the um, English Heritage Whitby Abbey site. And she says, Dr. Ramirez, you filmed here a few years ago, you were lovely, we talked a lot, really good to see you. So I, oh, it's so good to see you too. So we caught up, and she went, um, what are you doing at the moment? I said, well, I'm writing this book, Femina, I'm, I'm working on women from the past. And I was, you know, I was thinking about Hilda and how I tell a story that sort of relates to that. I said, well, you'll know about the Loftus Princess, of course. And I went, I probably should, shouldn't I? Um, yeah, of course I know about the Loftus Princess. She went, oh, yes, you know, just discovered just down the road, about 15 miles down the road um, at Street House in Loftus. Um, she's on display now in the local museum. We only, you know, she was only found a few years ago. You should definitely you know, go and have a look. And I was thinking, this sounds really interesting. So I started digging, and what I discovered was this amazing um, local archaeologist. His name is Steve Sherlock, and I love that. He's like the Sherlock Holmes of archaeology, discovering things. Um, he had been working away at this site at Street House for decades. And over those decades, he found a landscape that had changed constantly over through different eras, but had continually been reused, reappropriated. Um, people made, found new use for it. So there's this wonderful thing that he found, which was a Neolithic um, wooden circle. Uh, they found the post holes for these huge uh, wooden um, megaliths that would have stood in a circle with passageways through them. And, you know, he, he didn't know what it was. The speculation, was it ceremonial? Was it used for ritual purposes? Why is it there? And in the end, because they couldn't be conclusive, they just called it the Wasset, as in, what is it? Um, because nobody knows. So it's known as the Loftus Wasset, um, which I like. And so that, but this particular site, he could see it had been used in Neolithic times, it had been used right the way through the Iron Age, so big Iron Age forts and Iron Age circles. Then it was being used by the Romans, there's Roman remains all over it. And then, quite recently, in, um, I think it was 2002, he saw an aerial photo of this particular um, location. He wanted to look at what looked like the outline of Iron Age forts. Um, but in, cut into the Iron Age forts, can you see those circles that are sort of outlined? Cut into those were these sequence of graves and, um, and a couple of mounds, little burial mounds. So... This brought the Loftus site right up to the early medieval period. Once he started to look what was inside here, he realised that these finds were 7th century. Um, this means that this site, again, has taken on a new role. Now it's being used as a burial ground. And look how regular it is. All of the graves laid out as this sort of rectangle around the edges. And again, with these sorts of routes through, processional areas where you could move through the site. So something was going on here. He knew it was important. And then, she didn't look quite like this when he found her. This is a reconstruction. Um, the, this particular individual emerges from the very central burial, grave number 42, underneath the major mound, right at the very heart of the Loftus site. This is a reconstruction of what she would have looked like. You can see not much of this would have remained, but her jewellery was found, and the bed that she was buried in was also found. Now, I have already put my order in for a bed burial. I cannot think of a better way to go to the afterlife than asleep in a cosy, comfy bed. So, um, and this was a thing that starts around the 7th century, and it's always women that are being buried in these beds. And if you think yourself back, in, back to the 7th century, the things that are going on around this time it's a quite a macho world. It's a world where politics is about military might. There's conflict between kingdoms. You've got the Sutton Hoo ship burial, where, which is going on in East Anglia. You've got the Staffordshire horde going on in Mercia. This is expressions of, of the end of an era, an end of a sort of pre-Christian um, early medieval world. But for women, this, is, this becomes a way of distinguishing them in the grave, putting them in a bed, and burying them, of course, with jewellery. 
That changes, as you'll know. Christian burials that come in from the 8th century onwards, they tend to have nothing in the grave. You just shroud the body, lay them out east to west. But in these things that are called final phase burials, there's a mix. It's like they've got one foot in the past and one foot tentatively reaching towards a new Christian future. And this is why she fascinates me. And this is the story I wanted to tell. I didn't want to tell a story about a princess who lived in and around Loftus. I wanted to build up the world she lived in. I want to fill it with the people around her and the issues that were obsessing her and the things that were changing around her. And I have to do that with just bits of evidence like these. Now look at those. Aren't they beautiful? Um, so little known. Has anybody in the room seen any, or heard anything about the Loftus Princess before? I, I love this. No, so likewise. <laughs> um, and I think we should be telling her story. So she was found buried with these strung around her neck. You've got two cabochon garnets set into gold. You've got a couple of beads, and then you've got this massive central pendant. And it is absolutely beautiful, but it is unique. Another one of its kind has never been found, because in the very heart is this garnet shell. Such an unusual symbol. What does it mean? Why was she buried wearing it? Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. I mentioned there the Staffordshire hoard. Many of you will remember the joy when it was discovered. I remember because I had my very recently born son in one arm and a phone in the other going, you what has been found? Um, so it was a major, major discovery. The single biggest hoard of early medieval metalwork ever found. Um, hundreds and hundreds of, of pieces, thousands of pieces in fact, all in this fragmentary state, which suggests they've been prized off other objects, probably weapons. It's almost all, you know, um, hilts from swords, um, helmets, shields, they're military pieces. And what is entirely absent from the Staffordshire Horde is any female artifacts, anything associated with, with women. It's all about war, it's all about battle. So it's a wonderful find, but it's a find that gives us one view of that period. It doesn't take on board what the other 50% of the, and more of the population were doing. And, but what it does give us an insight into is the metalworking, the skill that was required to make these objects, these, these glimmers that stay in the earth and remind us that people were there before. And this is a, a panel from the Frank's casket in the British Museum, which many of you, I hope, will have seen. It's about the size of a shoebox, and it's made of walrus tusk ivory. And it depicts with runes around the edges that are really mysterious, riddling and um, runes, images that come from Jewish history, that come from Christian history, that come from Roman history. So you've got Romulus and Remus in the woods. And on the front, married up with one of the most unique depictions you'll ever see of the three magi visiting the baby Jesus and Mary. Alongside that is this scene. And it's a baffling scene in many ways because that the inscription doesn't really tell you what's going on in it. But you've got this bearded figure to the one side and then a woman approaching in a cape with another woman behind clasping a bag and then another woman who is strangling birds in the margin on the side. And there's a couple of clues as to what's going on in this scene because the character up against the frame, the male character, his leg, can you see it's bent like this? And that's an indication that we are dealing here with Welland the Smith. Welland Smithy, I mean, that's another sort of thing that where I live, there's quite a lot of Welland references. Um, the, the legend of Welland the Smith is part of Germanic mythology. He was the best worker of metal, um, so much so that he takes on this role as a, a, a god, a deity. But the story goes that this particular king, Nidund, didn't want to share his metalworking skills with anyone else. So he has him hamstrung. He has the, the, the strings at the back of the leg cut. And then he's imprisoned on an island, so he can never escape, and he has to work for the king, creating beautiful, beautiful jewellery. But Welland has a plan to escape. He lures the king's daughter... Oh, well, first, first, he lures the king's son over to the island, where he kills him, and he decapitates him. So can you see there's a body underneath Welland's legs, just lying on the floor? And he made a goblet out of the son's skull. Gory, gory, gory. And in this, he put the, I suppose, the um, early medieval version of Rohypnol, because then he invites the king's daughter over, gives her the goblet made of her brother's skull. She drinks this drugged liquid, and then he impregnates her and escapes on a flying machine made of bird feathers. I mean, it's 
you know, if Hollywood tried to put this on today, I think they'd have some issues. Um, it's hard. It's hard hitting. But this is the world that, that's filling the landscape, the imaginations, the, the language of the people that live in what we call England today. For a few hundred years, they were speaking a language that was more like Germanic, whereas people in Wales, in Cornwall, in Ireland, they were speaking Celtic tongues. They were believing in this pantheon of gods like Thor, like Odin, like Freya, while over the border, they were still worshipping Christ. It was a different little world, England, from 400 up to 7, 800 AD. And this is the time we find the Loftus Princess emerging. So I thought, if I put my frame around her, what else will I find? What else will I discover? Of course, I discovered the beauty of, of these early medieval metal workers. This is the Sutton Hoo shoulder clasp. I've held it in my own hands. I think that's one of my biggest life achievements was to hold the Sutton Hoo shoulder clasp in my hand. I did drop it, but I dropped it onto a cushion because I was so nervous. It was all fine. <laughs> it went about that far down like that. Uh, but it's, in, it's the most beautiful, beautiful, beautiful object in the world. And um, the more you look at it and the more you turn it and the more time you spend with it and the more you understand the mechanism of it and how it's made, you just, it just beggars belief. I've had students who have taken to the British Museum to see the Sutton Hill treasures and they've taken one look at this and I've tried to ask them, you know, how do you think they did it with no running water, no electricity, um, you know, very limited sort of um, resources, your eyesight, as soon as you got good enough to make the details would be going because of experience. And they said, well, it's obviously made by aliens. And I thought, well, there you go. So, new Channel 5 documentary, The Sutton Who Treasures Were Made by Aliens. Um, they're not made by aliens, but they are made by highly, highly, highly skilled craftspeople whose skills we have lost. When I went to Garrett's um, jewellers to ask them how they would go about today making a pair of Sutton Who shoulder clasps, they said I'd need £100,000 in materials. It would take two to three months to make one and they could only do the back plates to these using lasers. And yet these were made over 1,300 years ago. Um, maybe there's aliens. Who can say? But the artistry displayed in something like the Sutton Hoo treasures, that's top end. We're talking high society. This is a problem I'm sure you will come up against in your research as well. It's often so hard. You're, all the best artifacts, all the best houses, all the best archives tend to belong to the ones who had all the money and all the rights and power. Getting to the people underneath them is often really hard. And that's what I've tried to do in the book. I've tried to kind of say, oh, does it all have to be about kings and queens and rulers? Well, in the case of Loftus, what I love is Sutton Hoo is clearly the burial ground of a king, somebody absolutely at the top of the tree. When we get to Loftus, we've got someone middling, but powerful within her community. But what's really interesting is how all the people around her seem to have responded to her death. So if I just take you back for one second, um, if you look at the arrangement of the site, have I got a laser on this? I think I have. I won't use it to cut gemstones. I'll uh, do it to illuminate here. Can you see that there's a, a cut here in the graves, yeah? And can you see there's another sort of pathway and a cut with a ridge that runs down here? So what you've basically got is early medieval crowd control. This is, you know, enter here, move around here and pass out down the hill there. This is the way that the site has been articulated so that people can move through it. And that suggests that whatever's going on here is the real heart of the site. And what you've got, you've got a building that, well, this is a reconstruction of it. You've got a, what's known as a Grubenhauser, quite a simple wooden structure here. You've got the two major burial mounds here, and then you've got something that looks like a, a sort of prototype church. It's a very simple wooden structure, quite small. But remember, these graves are appearing around the year 600. And St. Augustine is just just turning up in the Isle of Thanet in 597. So this is a critical moment where, I mean, it's so funny, I'm sure you'll have all read books or chapters in books that say things like, the coming of Christianity. And this is, this is I have this wonderful vision of sort of everybody across the country wakes up on the uh, you know, 1st of July 597 and goes, 
It was Jesus, not Odin, all along. How did I not know? And that's it, completely. Christianity has come, and that is it. Um, of course, it's not like that. There is processes, and change is so slow. Uh, what's interesting with the, con- with the conversion is they start with the top, they start with the kings and the queens, and they try to filter it down. Um, but even in the 9th and the 10th century, you've got religious people saying, why are you still telling stories about Ingeld and about this hero and that god? and this? Because it takes time for these sorts of changes to filter down. And what we're seeing with a site like Loftus is that change, that ideological change. How do you find ideological change in, the, in, in records? Well, this site seems to be suggesting it. And what's really fascinating, and I think, again, I think this is why I slightly fell in love with the people of Loftus. They loved history and archaeology in the same way that I do. They've chosen this site at Loftus because it has a history. Because as they're laying their graves, they're seeing Roman stones. They're seeing the remains of an Iron Age fort. They're seeing the remains of the Wasset. They know that this landscape has a history. They could have picked anywhere along the coast. They picked this particular site that has history to put their own moment into it, their burials. But then they're also putting artifacts into the ground that are historic. Now, look at this, this necklace. You know there were the two mounds. So Steve Charlotte calls them Mound 41 and Mound 42. 42 is the princess burial in the bed. This is the one next to it. And this woman was buried with a necklace um, that you can see, these beautiful beads. And on either side are two coins. Now, at the time that the burial's taking place, England wasn't a monetary environment. They didn't use coinage. So these coins are not coins from the time that the woman has been buried, they are in fact Iron Age coins. So whoever this person is, they found these coins, dug them up, found them in a field, thought they were beautiful, and re-hung them into a necklace some four or five hundred years, six hundred years later. And what's amazing is, if you look at the imagery on them, can you see a horse? It's very stylized, but there's an eye here, And then this is the shape of the horse with the legs running down there. And here is another horse. There's its its head, and there's its back and its tails. Two horses. And what I love about how they've been strung is it's been done quite deliberately, so it looks like the horse is, is running across the woman's chest when she would have been wearing this. So it's quite modern. It's quite fun to imagine this, you know, on the person that was wearing it. But interestingly... What's on the other side of the coins, the the side of the coins that would have been pressed up against the lady's chest, are two crosses. A cross here and a cross there. Did she know they were there? Why was she wearing them? Well, this is part of a number of finds that are turning up across England at this critical point around the year 600. And they, on the outside, look like they're part of the old tradition. So look at this one. This one's called the Eccles Buckle. On the outside, you've got two knotted serpents... Um, and they're either side of a double-headed dragon. Now, this is all the imagery of Beowulf. This is the world of pre-Christian Germania. But on the inside is this silver plate in the shape of a fish. Now, Christians still use the fish to identify... uh, You can get bumper stickers with fish on. And it's because the word fish in Greek is ichthyos. And each of the letters of the word ichthyos form part of the sentence, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Saviour. And that's why for two millennia, the fish has been used as a shorthand reference to Christianity, ichthyus. So this person who's wearing this buckle, on the one hand, they're signaling to the people looking at them, I'm, I'm, I'm totally part of the old vanguard, I'm all here for Odin and Thor. But on the inside, they're hedging their bets. They've got this fish. And it's happening again and again. So we find things like this buckle, this brooch, this is the Kingston brooch. Um, up until that point, I don't know, you probably can't see, I'm, <laughs> for Valentine's Day, my husband's so romantic, he, he bought me a reproduction of the Faversham um, pendant, because that's what you get, a medievalist. I love it. Uh, but I don't know if you can see, it's three ravens with cabochon eyes, and they're in a circle, and, there's, and it's the number three. And three is the number of Odin. Um, ravens are the birds of Odin. This was found in a grave around the year 600, and it's very much off the earlier tradition. But when you look at this, the number three has, is out. What is in? A cross shape, the number four. Can you see there's multiple fours going on across this brooch? So suddenly the whole aesthetic of jewellery is starting to slowly, slowly change. And ideas are coming in. And who are they coming with? 
the women. Who has heard of Bertha of Kent? Somebody does. Yes, thank you, thank you. Hey, <laughs> that's, that's an extra high five. Not only are you working hard with the camera, you also know about Bertha of Kent. So one of these women who we do have a record of, again, a queen, unfortunately, a high echelon member of society, but the wife of Athelbert of Kent, the King of Kent in, um, around the, from about the year 560 up to the time of Augustine, 597 and beyond. Now, Bertha was a Frankish princess who was married to this pagan Athelbert of Kent as a way of Christianizing the people of that kingdom. And when she got over to Kent, she came way before Augustine. She probably came in the in 560s. And she insisted that this building, St. Martin's in Canterbury, which is the oldest church still in use in the world, in Kent, um, that, that it has uh, Roman bricks in it. And she had it reused, reappropriated, and turned into her personal chapel. But she also ordered that her bishop come with her, Bishop Ludhard. And in a wonderful archaeological historical twist of fate, not only have we got a building that we know associated with Bertha, a named individual, Ludhard, the bishop, a text, because Bede, in his ecclesiastical history, writes lots about Bertha, and lots of references in letters and other surviving documents to this woman. There was then this remarkable discovery of the St. Martin's Hoard, of which this is a part, this medal. And this is known as the Ludhard Medalette. Now, you can see it's been strung as a, a pendant to be worn around the neck, but it was originally a coin. And as I mentioned, the English are not striking coins at this point. This is an imported coin, or at least the style of it is certainly imported. And what is fascinating is you have this figure who looks very Romanesque, you know, got the, the, the laurel and the toga. And around the edge uh, is the name Ludhard. Who is Ludhard? Bertha's bishop. But something is unusual about this because the letters are back to front. Now, what has happened, probably, I mean, I, I, when I first read about the Ludhard Medalette, all the books go, oh, stupid, ignorant, early medievalists, didn't have a clue, aren't they idiots? Well, I'm trying to explain is they're not idiots. They are working with new ideas, new concepts, new terminology. They don't have Latin literacy at this point. They're not using writing, and they're not using coins. And somebody says, make us a coin that looks like this. So they've taken the original, they've carved it into a stamp, and when they've gone to stamp it, it's come out back to front. But because they can't read, they can't determine whether it's back to front or not. So that's not stupidity. You know, illiteracy and stupidity are two very different things. But it is an indication that they're changing and they're having to embrace so much so fast. Don't you find this exciting? I find it exciting because I don't like necessarily doing the big wars that change history. But when it's this sort of ideological transformation, how do you find that in the historical record? Well, it seems there are these little breadcrumbs that lead us back. And of course, things are very different on the continent. So you've got um, here Empress Theodora, very famously depicted in the San Vitale um, mosaics. And what I find, again, a, a reminder of how international and engaged parts of the early medieval world were, is if you look at the necklace she's wearing there. Now, this is from Italy, but of course, Theodora is reigning all the way over in Constantinople, Istanbul. And yet, in Kent, at exactly the same time, what's popping up in a woman's grave? The exact same <laughs> necklace. So it's almost like this woman in Kent has got her latest copy of Hello Magazine Europe delivered and has thought, oh, that's a nice necklace. I'll get one of those made up. She's copying the fashion. And it's completely different to the fashion of what everyone else around her is wearing at the time. But what's coming in are these things, these cabochons, these big fat gems set in. Before that, as you saw, it's all about the um, uh, cosinate, the, the cut gems that are smoothed and set in cells. But suddenly the fashion turns, it twists, and it becomes about cabochons. And yet, we've got a foot in the past and a foot in the future. These other weird objects start popping up in graves from exactly the same time as Loftus. These are equal armed crosses that are made with the techniques that go back to the pagan past of, of Sutton Hoo, of Odin and Thor, but in the service of the Christian church, a cross. And goodness me, they're popping up in fields all over the place. There have been a couple of recent discoveries. Holderness Cross has just popped up, but it's such it's this meeting of worlds, the old tradi um, traditional techniques, but using new symbols, new ideas. 
And, um, and I love it because my job as a historian, as I see it, is to put all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together as best as I can, which means I end up being interdisciplinary. I do work with DNA analysis. I do work with um, osteoarchaeologists. And I also look at artworks, artifacts, and then I look at texts. But it's pulling them all together to me that matters. I wouldn't imagine trying to tell you what it's like to be alive as me in 2022 by just showing you the latest headlines of the Times newspaper. That's not my only source of evidence for what it's like to be alive now. I might play you some music, I might show you some art, I might show you some film, but that's how you put a person into the context of the past. And that's why I'm an interdisciplinary historian. Um, but what I like about this is Bede even knew about these jewels that were being made, I think, because he says, um, when he's talking about St. Cuthbert, and we may know St. Cuthbert, buried in Durham Cathedral, big, big player, for he, Cuthbert, not only provided an example to his brethren of the monastery, but also sought to lead the minds of the neighbouring people to the love of heavenly things. Many of them, indeed, um, disgraced the faith which they professed by unholy deeds, and some of them, in the time of mortality, neglecting the sacrament of their creed, had recourse to idolatrous remedies, as if by charms or amulets or any other mysteries of the magical arts, they were able to avert a stroke inflicted upon them by the Lord. <gasps> Big quote. So these people who are tentatively converting around this year, 600, 620, they might say, oh, yes, I'm totally on board. I believe in Jesus. And yeah, tell me about the Bible. And yet, when it's coming close to death, they're reverting to their old ways. And they're having amulets, charms um, put on their bodies when they're put in the grave. I mean, B wrote it as it was. And even the people at the top of this fledgling English church were doing this. So these are finds from Hilda's Abbey of Whitby. This is a comb that was discovered in, Hilda's, um, in the ruins of Hilda's Abbey, and it's inscribed with a runic love poem. This is the actual coffin that St. Cuthbert was buried in, the oldest surviving piece of wood in England in terms of medieval wood. And it's got angels and saints and Christ and the Virgin all over, carved in this sort of quite simple cartoon style around the sides. And yet, it's also got runic inscriptions carved in runes being associated the, the symbolic alphabet that was used in, in Germanic territories. So it's a time of complete transition. And this is his pectoral cross. It wasn't discovered until recently, but it was wrapped in the bindings pressed up against his chest. So every time there was those stories that monks used to brush the hair of the corpse of, of Cuthbert because it kept growing after... Oh, I, I don't know which is weirder, the, the fact it's still growing or the fact that someone's opening it up to keep combing it. I don't both weird. Um, but the, the, despite the fact that they're opening it, looking at it for year after year after year, nobody noticed this object. It was only recently when um, the coffin was moved that they found tucked right inside was this cross, which is everything we've seen with the others. And then we come back, um, sorry, I will, I will wind this up, but if I flag us back just briefly to Loftus. This is her pendant. This is what she is wearing around her neck. Now, what is going on here? On the one hand, she has these two cabochons that are clearly inspired by, by Theodora, by the fashions that are coming from the continent into Kent and up to the north. But what about this one in the middle? You have got cloisonne cut jewels and then this massive raw cut garnet in the shape of a shell. Well, interestingly, these garnets around the edge are all reused. That means that somebody had an object, like a belt buckle, like a shoulder clasp, that she owned, and she's had the garnets taken out of it and reset in this way. Why is she doing that? The memory of a loved one? I was just doing um, a programme about the, royal about the um, crown jewels yesterday, and it was really interesting. The Queen's wedding ring is made of a solitaire and five uh, diamonds on each side, which Philip designed, and he used the tiara of his mother, Alice, to make the Queen's engagement ring. And I thought, God, that's like this. She has taken an object and had the jewels reused and recast in this unique way. But she's used that old traditional method. But then this central gem, what does it mean? A shell, what does it mean? Well, it's not a cross, it's not a fish, but it is a very old Christian symbol. Has anybody done or heard of the Santiago de Compostela? Yeah, oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. What do you see all the way along there? 
shells. It's shells all the way. The symbol of St. James, but also the symbol of um, death and martyrdom and resurrection. So if you go around any church, you might see a saint or a figure, a religious figure, under a shell canopy. And that's a sign that they are eternally mortal. And it comes from Aphrodite, the story of Aphrodite. She was apparently washed up on a shell, born from nothing, um, apart from, well, it's rather gross, but it was the cut-off private parts of, of one of the gods. But she appears out of nothing from the sea and becomes this immortal deity. When Christianity was looking for symbols in its early days, thinking, oh, we'll use the fish because of this, oh, we'll use the cross because of that, they landed on the shell because they said, well, as Aphrodite came out and as, as an immortal deity, we can use it to describe the eternal life of the saints. And so this symbol changes meaning, but it becomes embedded with this association with Christianity and with immortality. What better thing to put around the neck of somebody who's touching their toes into the water of Christianity around the year 600? It looks backwards, it looks forwards, it's symbolic without being too overt, it's fashionable, and it's survived. And I took the time to bother to look at it and think about it, and as a result, I hope I put a slightly different window onto this time. Um, so they're not unrecoverable, they're there. They just survive in very small remains. Um, I'm going, I have <laughs> totally overrun. Do you want me to carry on right the way through to four, or do you want me to stop a little bit before, or... 10, 15 more minutes. You all right with that, everybody? I have an extra PowerPoint here that I'm going to have to go through. So I will show you what you, what you could have won uh, if I'd spoken a bit quicker. I was going to talk to you about Kinnathrith, the discovery of Kinnathrith's monastery just this year. Um, I was going to talk about Islamic dinars and how they rock up in, in England. I was going to talk about Mercia. There's the Staffordshire Horde again. Lichfield. I was going to talk about Athelflaed, which is, of course, Lady of the Mercians. But you'll have to read the book to find out all of this. But I will finish by talking to you about Marjorie, because I promised you at the beginning I would. And this takes you from the very beginning of my book, 600-700 AD, up to the 14th century and the lifetime of Marjorie Kemp. And we haven't geographically moved that far. We've gone from Loftus up the coast, down the coast to, to uh, East Anglia. And she grew up in King's Lynn, here. And the reason I, this is not the map that's in the book. I had a much nicer map made for the book. But this one I like because it's got colourful lines on it, which makes a bit of sense. But it shows the many pilgrimages that this woman, Marjorie Kemp, took. So you can see she gets over to Santiago. She goes all the way around France. She goes down into Rome, into Italy. She gets all the way to Jerusalem. And she does this walking, hitching rides on carts, travelling by a donkey, but she's moving more than further distances than many of us might today. And yet we think of a medieval woman being, you know, must stay home and, and stir this pot of gruel for the next 10 years. Um, and we only know about Marjorie Kemp because of a chance survival. And this is why I love being a historian. Everything can be rewritten <laughs> overnight when you get that phone call like I did holding my son. Oh, the Staffordshire Horde's been found. Oh, my goodness. But these things, these discoveries, now we have social media and the internet. We're hearing about them week on week on week. So I start every chapter in the book with a discovery because that's what I think is so key about our discipline. It relies on new discoveries. And the discovery in this case was made in the 1930s. And <laughs> it's a funny story. Um, a stately home. Colonel William Erdswick Ignatius Butler Bowden. That's his house. He wants to play ping pong in his country mansion. Rummaging for a set of balls in a stuffed cupboard, he finds his progress impeded by dozens of dusty old books. I'm going to put the whole bloody lot on the bonfire tomorrow, and then we may be able to find ping pong balls and bats when we want them. Uh, he shouts to his guest. The latter happens to be a curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And he cautions him not to put the books on the fire, adding that there may be something of real interest there, which you may not at the moment realise. And there certainly was. In amongst those dusty books and ping pong balls and bats was the book of Marjorie Kemp. And it is the single most extraordinary read. I've now read it cover to cover about seven times. Every time I read it, I'm like, I cannot believe... A, that this was ever written, B, that this woman ever existed, and C, that it survived. These three things should not have <laughs> happened. But this one book gives us a glimpse into a world like no other. Um, this is Kings Lynn, and you could still go to Kings Lynn and see the landscape that 
Marjorie walked through. And again, this was a point with my book. I wanted to start with a discovery, so the Burka warrior woman, the Loftus princess, Marjorie's book. And then I wanted to go take you to the place at the time, so 14th century Kings Lynn. You are in 14th century Kings Lynn. What do you see? And these buildings survive, so you know that Marjorie would have been inside them. She'd have walked under them. And there are objects there that are from the time, and this is down to what, you know, this local historian's need to dig deeply into the things around us, around... I went to Kings Lynn, spent the whole day digging through the churches, looking at the pew ends, photographing the things behind other things, and I found these ends. And on the one side, you have this woman. She's not a nun. She's not a queen. She's not a noblewoman. She has the dress and the wimple of a woman of means, but probably a tradeswoman. And on the other side, you have the hat and the attire of a, a merchant, a tradesman. And they are back to back, the man and the woman, pressed up alongside each other. And they date to Marjorie's lifetime. She would have looked at this. She might have seen herself in it or seen someone she didn't like <laughs> in it. She was a very jealous woman. She didn't like her neighbours very much. And then there's things like this, the King John's Cup which is still in the town hall in, in Kings Lynn. Amazingly, it just hasn't moved for like 700 years. And I love it because it, take, it shows you the clothes that the women wore. And what's so interesting is women and men alternate around the outside and on the lid. But there are more women than men depicted all the way around. And when you got to the very bottom of the cup, inside, carved at the bottom, was this woman with a bird on her hand. And you sort of get the sense of the mixed community that would have enjoyed feasting with that cup, the people that Marjorie was surrounded by. But what is so brilliant about Marjorie is she's, she's quite controversial. So she has 14 children. She tries her hand at everything. First of all, she wants to brew beer. That fails. Then she wants to set up a mill uh, to grind flour, which is expensive. And she gets a literal millstone, which she thinks will make her very rich, very important within the community. That fails. Um, and she tries her hand at all these different entrepreneurial exercises. Her husband, bless him, stands by her the whole time, every time she gets a wild new idea. But when she hits her 30s, she realises there's these international celebrities that are mystics, female mystics, who are making a killing on the continent, going around, doing talks, blessing people, and being, living the life of absolute luxury. Bridget of Sweden, Mary of Orient, they are the celebrities of the time. And Marjorie thinks... I could try my hand at that. I quite fancy the limelight, I quite fancy the wealth and the comfort. So she becomes a professional mystic. And the things that identify Mar Marjorie's mysticism is unrelenting, loud crying all over the place, particularly in public places where lots of people get embarrassed. She will fall on the floor and weep and weep and weep and weep. And it's like, it's God, it's God is making me cry. So she is... Um, a loud character. And the way she comes through in the book is as this larger-than-life figure. This is a quote about... She's told her husband that, although they've had 14 children, um, she is a virgin and will not sleep with him again. <laughs> and she says, um, <laughs> they're, in, they're in this lovely... It's midsummer eve, and they're having a drink, and they're at a party. And he says to her, Marjorie, if there came a man with a sword who would slice off my head unless I should have sex with you as I have done before, tell me the truth from your conscience, for you say you will not lie, whether you would allow my head to be sliced off or allow me to be intimate with you like in the past. <laughs> she replies, truthfully, I'd rather see you be slain that we should turn to the impurity of sexual activity. I mean, and he sticks by her right the way through, stays with her, funds all her journeys, gets, you know, absolutely harangued by her over and over, and embarrassed by her behaviour too, but he stands by her. And what I think is important with these stories is, I didn't want to just find one lone female figure and tell you in a couple of hundred words why we should know about her. I wanted to build the world they live in. I wanted to put the men, the women, the people of different backgrounds, of classes, of disabilities, of, of all origins, back around these people, build the the actual world they were in, not just tell you why you should know about them. And um, what I love about Marjorie is she, is she is a real Marmite figure. So this is another quote from the book. Please read it. I mean, honestly, best piece of work. Her confessor was displeased. because This is when she's on pilgrimage and she's having a really bad time and everybody hates her and nobody wants to travel with her. Um, and, and, and then, she, then she gets back and, um, and she's getting told off. Her confessor was displeased because she ate no meat 
and, um, and so many were off the company, they were also most displeased because she wept so much and was always talking about the love and goodness of our Lord at table as well as at other places. So she's a bit of a you know, dinner bore. Um, therefore, shamefully, they rebuked her and downright chided her and said they would not endure her as her husband did when she was at home in England. And they do awful things to her on the road to Jerusalem. They slash her clothes so that she's walking around looking very vulnerable. Um, and she is so scared. And what is one of the wonderful things that comes out of the book of the Magic Kent? Travel in the medieval period. How she goes on these pilgrimages that are like a package holiday, where they promise lovely place to stay, we'll get you from A to B safely. And then she comes up against all these sorts of tourist dramas along the way. She loses people, people let her go. And it's this real insight into what it was to like to be alive, to be moving around at that time. And last thing, because I will stop. This is the closing aspect of Marjorie's book. And for me, it doesn't sum up just Marjorie. It sums up every one of us, men and women. We are complex. If you try and put a pin in any one of us at any one time and define us, say what it is that we're about, how do you do that? We're constantly changing ourselves. And we're complex and we're difficult to pin down. And as historians, we will only ever get an insight, a glimmer, a flicker of what these people from the past were like. But I think we need to constantly remind ourselves that they were as we are now, as complex, as Marmite as some of us are today. And this is her closing view of her, she herself. Some people said it was a wicked spirit that vexed her. Some said it was a sickness. Some said she had drunk too much wine. Some cursed her. Some wished that she were thrown into the harbour. Some wished she were put out to sea in a bottomless boat. Others loved and esteemed her. And that's the thing that comes through in every one of these chapters. There is not one narrative. There is not, she's a good guy, she's a bad guy, people loved her, people hated her. These stories are complicated. And I said it in the book, and I'll say it to every one of you, because I know you can do it. I say it at the beginning and the end of the book, this is the start of a conversation where we hand on the baton to each other. If any of the stories or any of the information in the book sparks an interest, we have the power to pursue it. We can go to our archives. We can go and look in our local churches. We can go to our, um, our digital resources now, and we can be the detectives, the historians that are looking for the stories. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, have we got time for a few questions? Can everybody ah. hear me? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, I think we're just going to move to questions. Yes. Yep, yep. No, you're absolutely right. It, the, the title that St. Martin's has is the oldest church in the English-speaking world. But the fabric of the church has been dated back uh, quite early in the Roman period. So uh, there's an argument that it's the oldest church in the English-speaking world in continuous use, as in it's been used as a church since since Bertha in 560. But the fabric itself of the church goes back another three, four hundred years before that. So that's their, their claim for being the oldest. But of course, you're right, there's always going to be other claimants. I think I've been to five of the oldest pubs in England. <laughs> so I'm not sure which one's the oldest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I have a 1936 Ordnance Survey map that has the date against St. Martin's Church of AD 187. Wow, thank you. <laughs> well, there you go. That is an excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to see the Ordnance Survey map. <laughs> uh, so I'll just, just thank you for that amazing talk. Brilliant, love it, iconic. Um, and you'll be pleased to know that you have lit a spark because I was really taken by the story of the Loftus Princess. Uh -huh. And I actually run a YouTube channel about Yorkshire history. So I really want to tell her story. And if I don't find everything about her in your book, I just wanted to know what are the best sources 
uh, that I can find out about. Uh, with the caveat, though, that I don't currently have academic access. So unless I steal something, from, <laughs> you know, uh, what resources may I be able to borrow or find publicly available? Oh, God, you have warmed my heart. And I am so pleased you ended up with my book because, of course, you can start it. Oh, you saying that is why I get up in the morning. The idea that if I might have sown even the smallest little seed that you might go off and look into is absolutely heartwarming. Go to Loftus. Go to the local museum. It's small, but the whole display there has got all the finds. It's got um, her reconstructed like that. And quite a lot of information on the boards that will give you some context. And then, as you say, you haven't got access to the, art, to the um, academic archives. But there is a scholarly tome, and I think you can pick it up probably on Amazon. It might not be cheap, but it's the archaeological record, the BAR, the British Archaeological Report record, that Steve drew up off this excavation. And it's the street how street how Street House Loftus um, excavation report. Um, so that will have everything in it. It's a, it's a great, and then that will ping you off onto different articles as well. Um, but yeah, that's your starting point, my lovely. Yay! <laughs> okay, probably what, one more? One more. Thank oh, you. Oh. Thank you. I want the wisdom of the crowd, please, everybody <laughs> here. Um, would it be possible to look at the pectoral cross of St. Cuthbert? Again? Of course, of course. The wisdom of the crowd, what, what everybody thinks. Where are you, Cuthbert's Cross? There it yeah. is. I'm just very interested, just as a poll of everybody here, you've got the garnet, nice garnet work, very Anglo-Saxon. Look at the arms of the cross. Does anyone yep. else see Thor's hammer? Yep, 100%. Yeah? Does anyone we, agree? Well, you know why the Thor's hammer emerged? Yeah. Um, it was because, it was as a counterpoint, because... Originally, as I mentioned, uh, most of the pre-Christian religious symbol symbolism was like this, Triskels. And it was Triskels and birds, ravens, all connected with Odin. And Odin was the chief of the gods. But Thor starts to appear almost um, around the same time in kind of contradiction to Christianity. But there was a, a, a requirement that a non-Christian could not trade with a Christian. And so they started designing Thor's hammers to give the oppression from afar that it was a cross. And then when they went up to start and trade with Christians, they would make the sign of the cross, the Primus Signata. And it's like, oh, he's fine, I can trade with him. He's not really a, a pagan from the north. So that is absolutely all of these things, you know, it's it's the evolution of symbols tell us the evolution of thoughts, but they also put, tell us about trade and economics and politics. So, yeah, it's fascinating stuff, and you're right, it does look like a Thor's hammer. <gasps> Thank you, I have to stop. I, I feel hovering. <laughs> Thank know. you all. Thank you all Don't so, worry. so much. Thank you. Oh, well, thanks. No, no. <laughs> take, you take your correct round of applause and bow. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll feel off on this side. Oops. Uh, many thanks, Ginny, and for such a rich, wonderful, and clearly, I, I knew Catherine would say she was inspired by that. <laughs> Inspiring talk. Now, I think we're going to move to close the AGM, oh, not, not the AGM, the Local History Day now, and I'm going to invite Caroline back up on stage again, Great. please. And I will disappear well, off. Thank you so much. I'll just go to the Thanks side. <laughs> so, th uh, from me, as, well, I, I should now say the new chair, I guess, no, many thanks to all of you for coming, yeah, both in the hall and online. And I hope you will join us at all of our future online and hopefully in-person events in the next year or so. Um, do we want the... Yeah, they're just going to turn the mic on. I, I will disappear. Right, I, I was afraid that Janina was going to go before I'd had a chance to thank her, but she, she promised she would stay. I thought that was really amazing. I mean, I think those medieval women have met their match in Janina. I think they, they've got... You know, I think you're really doing them justice. It was a fantastic talk. You took us back to mainly to Anglo-Saxon England. I know you meant to move further on, but somehow we got stuck in Anglo-Saxons, didn't we? But anyway, the, today we've actually looked at women quite a lot, because Mark Forrest talked to us about medieval women who acted as reeves and as, uh, as manorial officials, and then we heard about the women who in the 19th and 20th century were suffragettes, who, who made uh, ammunition for the First World War, who rode on globes from London to no, Canterbury to London. I'm not sure how useful that was, but never mind. And also, you know, who set up home in 1933. I mean, we know that women are part of the story. It's just that, as Janina says, we have to look harder to find them. But she's done a really fantastic job. And, of course, we all want to get your book. It's a pity we couldn't all have copies of that. 
put our hand up. I, I like, I mean, Marjorie Kemp is, as you say, a Marmite character. Some people really don't like, I like the story of how she went off on this trip. You know, she went to Danzig and then she went to Arken and she finally comes back to Ipswich and she meets her confessor and he says, I told you to go no further than Ipswich. And I love that story, you know, that she just got going and off she went. Anyway, I think, I think that Janina gave us a really fantastic finale to this day, which we've really enjoyed. It's been great to meet each other again in person. And I think that, uh, you know, to have that wonderful talk and with so much enthusiasm and energy, I think, um, you know, you said that Marjorie Kemp uh, was, thought she was loved and esteemed. And we think you're loved and esteemed. Thank you very much. <laughs>